getting started. This is South Coast Tonight with Chris McCarthy and Marcus Farrow. They've got you covered on all the news of the day. From local issues to politics on both sides of the aisle. This is the place where the movers and shakers come to be heard. To listen. And where they're held accountable. This is South Coast Tonight on WBSM. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. I'm Marcus. So the city council just wrapped up their meeting here uh, and uh, they voted on some important things and joining us now for some council post game immediately following the meeting is city council president Ian Abreu. Hey, Ian. Oh, uh, hey, good. Good evening, Marcus. How are you? Good. How are you, how are you doing? Good. I'm driving home from the meeting. So if uh we get dodgy on the reception. Just let me know, and I'll try to get to a better area. Well, shouldn't you get better p- reception on the peninsula? That that should be a thing that you uh, that you champion. Believe it or not, Marcus, my street, which is right near the poor farm, is a complete dead zone. I have to get a hot spot in my house. The new house that I have, it's funny. They didn't disclose that when they sold the house to me. The the seller's agent didn't just tell me that the whole house was a uh, was a dead zone for service. But thank God for Wi Fi calling. No kidding. So we're speaking with um, with Ian Abreu. He is the city council president. He just got out of a meeting. Ian, so your meeting wrapped up on the agenda was a very important item, which uh, which was regarding raising pay for a uh, hundred plus non union jobs in the city. How did that vote go? We passed it to a second reading tonight. It's an ordinance, so it cleared. Two major hurdles so far. It cleared the first vote out of the Committee on Finance. Okay. Then it went to the full council tonight, for which we passed it to a second reading. So uh, that now tonight was the last meeting of the full city council for the calendar year 2022. So what will happen is we'll pick this back up in the beginning of January in the new year. Uh, and, uh, you know, then we'll vote accordingly. But I see no hiccups here. Uh, this is uh, a vote that's um, long overdue, and uh, I'm glad we... We acted accordingly. The vote was nine to one tonight. Well, actually, excuse me. It was uh, it was a unanimous vote, but there was an attempted a uh, couple of attempted uh, amendments on the floor to knock a couple of pay grades down, but those amendments failed. Those failed nine to one. Were, were the uh, uh, um, who, who proposed them? Uh, Councilor Morado proposed a couple of votes to cut the uh, the grades for the commissioner of the, the Department of Public Infrastructure and the director of our well, facilities and fleet management, well, which I did not support that. Why would you cut the DPI commissioner? You'd have to ask her that question, but I know she doesn't come on the show, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, <laughs> but, I just... Uh, but no, I, I don't know. In my opinion... Poor Jamie Pont. I mean, he, he, he does a good job over there, and DPI's, DPI well, is, is so right. important to, to what you guys do, really, um, uh, well, as what? city councilors. Well, whether it's J.B. Pont or whomever assumes the position, whether he leaves one day and Justin Chitka, who's his deputy, takes over, or sure. Jimmy Costa, whomever it is one day, or if we outside hire somebody else in the future, this is such a vital position for the city of New Bedford. Uh, it oversees hundreds of AFSCME employees uh, that are doing the work every day. Uh, it's everything from plowing the streets to making sure that our water pipes are deleaded and we've got that program going on to ensuring that our roads and walkways and sidewalks are safe, uh, everything from that to street lights to make sure that our street lights are working correctly. It's, it's a 24-7, 365 job. I, I'm sure you can imagine uh, there's been times I've texted or called Jamie on a Saturday night about an emergency, and we're right on it as a city, and that's akin to the great folks at DPI. So I was not... Uh, interested in trying to cut that salary yeah it's strange especially because she um you know put forward a motion that uh, amendment that was passed to give the animal control officer which is an important job a uh uh, like a 40k pay raise and wants to go and the director of licensing as well and the director of licensing as well so interesting so um it passed it's going to go to the ordinance committee do you expect any amendments to be proposed there um there could be amendments proposed, but I don't. I don't foresee that happening at this point. Um, I think the amendments that were attempted were exhausted tonight. But again, any councilor will have the right to make amendments uh, for the final meeting. So what will happen is, remember, um, we think we may have discussed this um, uh, when we do pass it. This will be retroactively 
uh, in force to October yeah. 1st of this year. So okay. when you get your bump, or we, if and when we ordain this in January, um, the pay will be retro to October 1st. So um, that's just kind of the way it played out. I really wish we could have punched this into the goal line before the holidays for our families. But Would have been the, nice. calendar, the calendar just didn't work out that way this year with all of our meetings. And we had the item in our ordinance committee for two different meetings because there was a lot of debate, a lot of presentation, a lot sure. of questions. But sometimes, you know, Marcus, you're, you're astute with the legislative and political process. Uh, sometimes uh, the process is what's needed to get things done. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a, it's still, it's a necessary ordinance, but it's still a big, it's a big process and it's 151 non-union jobs uh, and you're, you're giving them a pretty good pay raise. Um, and it's, it's going to cost the city, I think like $700,000, which is less than 1% of the. And you know what? Uh, and, and Mayor Mitchell said this and I said the same thing. And I, I said the same thing to a reporter for the New Bedford Light. In my view, um, the city uh, residents and our taxpayers, both constituent resident uh, 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 homeowners and the commercial business owner taxpayers, deserve the best and brightest, most competent department heads yeah. and non-union workers here and working in City Hall. Um, the cost to subsidize um, uh, someone who uh, is not trained or educated or, um, or uh, to be honest with you, not up to snuff for the job, yeah. The cost to subsidize that is more costly than paying someone a decent wage to attract competent talent. So that's kind of my view on the whole situation, and that was why I voted the way I voted to get this through. The other thing I just wanted to pass along tonight, that was a hot item. We had a special meeting before the full council meeting uh, tonight. Is We did adopt the calendar uh, 2023 residential and commercial tax rates, and I'd like okay. to talk about that. Sure. Um, so... We adopted the minimum shift based on the uh, revenues uh, received uh, by the assessing department. And um, the uh, it gets kind of technical, and I can get into the gobbledygook of the shift. And, Might as well. And, and the rates. But what, what I do want to say is this, okay? Based on the fact that our council, we cut $3.4 million out of the fiscal year budget, and based on the fact that the administration – dumped in $3 million of American Rescue Act funding, ARPA money, towards against the tax levy. So we had $6.4 million that we had saved, a combination of saving and putting in against the tax levy to help subsidize any type of major tax increase this year, which I'm happy about. So, for example, we adopted the, it's called a shift of 1.75%, but the, to, to put it in plain English, the residential property tax rate for the residents of New Bedford starting in 2023 based off the budget that we set and the property values of what they are valued at as of right now has been set at $14.29 per thousand of valuation of your property. And the commercial taxpayers will see also a drop in their tax rate to $29.88 per thousand of valuation. So we'll compare that to the 2022 fiscal calendar year rates, the residents, uh, the private homeowner of New Bedford, paid $15.54 per thousand last year. So we're dropping over a buck uh, per thousand for residents. And then for the commercial taxpayers, in 2022, they paid $33.51 and we dropped it again to twenty nine dollars and eighty eight cents. That, that's, that's pretty sig- that's pretty significant that you were able to do that. So that was a that was a combination of savings um, and uh, an allocation of ARPA money that allowed you to lower uh, by a few dollars the the resident residential and, and commercial tax. That's that's correct. This year's targeted tax levy was just over one hundred and forty six point uh, eight million, which could change upon the. Department of Revenue DOI's review and approval of our tax rate recap sheet. sheet. Sure. But the maximum shift toward the business class that uh, that we could have done this year uh, was the 1.75. We could not exceed that. So even though we went to the maximum shift against the businesses technically and the maximum decrease shift for the residents, it was still quite a drop for the commercial taxpayers. Um, so I'm happy with it. Uh, I'm happy with the vote tonight. I'm happy on where we're at. Um, the, the values for taxation, remember, for fiscal year 2023, um, determined uh, uh, for, as of January 1st, 2022, uh, based on sales, remember, preceding the last two years. So that's how we 
evaluate uh, the t- uh, that's how we uh, kind of grade our rubric for property values. We always go back two years, so we we judged our rubric or the assessors department, and we do have elected assessors, Marty Treadup, Kim Tre- uh, Kim Saunders, who's the chairman this year, and Peter Berthium. Mm-hmm. They based it off of the sales of the last two years. So of that, we are required to use at least 2% of sales for each class is valid, arm's length transactions. Um, so sales resulting, just a note, sales resulting from foreclosures, bankruptcies, estates, families, etc., are not allowed to be used in this required uh, database. Okay. Um, so the total new growth for tax year 2023, if this is a good sign, this is new growth that we brought into the city, was $1,732,820. So that means new commercial tax base, meaning new businesses, new home purchases. That's a good thing, considering we're still in the midst of a pandemic, Mm -hmm. just kind of getting out of it, and we still grew by $1.7 million and change. I'm very optimistic about the future of the city when you look at those numbers. Yeah, that's great. And and so um, when you – and another thing, important thing to just clarify, too – you lowered the tax rate. You did it by a few uh, a few dollars, which is going to be important. Uh, it's really important. It's it's uh, especially when you go when you add it up per one thousand dollars the value of your home. Uh, that all adds up. But um, you know that that rate is going to be applied onto whatever the assessor's office values those properties at. Well, that, well, well that's correct. Uh, the average property value in New Bedford. Is just over four hundred thousand. Now you could own a home that's valued at three hundred and ten thousand dollars, which you'll see quite a drop. You could you could own a home. I'll just make a. a you could own a home on Sasquatch Pond. Yeah, that's going to be valued at seven hundred or eight hundred thousand. You may have a huge backyard. You may have an in-ground pool, or you may have a bungalow uh, in the south end, like where I used to live, my first home, which was just a two-bedroom and no backyard, and that's valued at. Two hundred and ninety thousand dollars. It's all relative. It all depends on really what your property value is. Assess that, and that is correct. And I think it would be really good for the listeners of your show. Um, and I know that you really dive into public policy locally. You know, uh, invite Kim Saunders on. She's the chairman of the board of assessors. I know she'd love to come on, or even Peter Berthium or Marty Treadup. I think it'd be great to get one of them to come on to talk about the process for which they have to follow per Department of Revenue DOR regulations and how they can go about assessing property values. Yeah, I actually think that's a great idea. I mean, we're all, you know, we're usually talking to, you know, the city council and and Mayor Mitchell and um, you know, to a lesser extent school committee members, but there is, you know, it's a it's a pretty big city government and there's a few elected positions that I think um, you know, people would like to would like to hear from and I, I think that's a good idea. Absolutely. And um uh, uh, I, I've had a pleasure. You know, uh, tonight, uh, you may see on social media, Marcus, uh, tonight was my last full council meeting uh, chaired as the council president for 2022. So oh. um, I made it. You uh, made it. Yeah, you made, made it. it. And uh, it was an honor to serve uh, the residents of the city as their council president this year. I think we got a lot done this year legislatively. Uh, whether it was the ARPA uh, deal that we got done for the American Rescue Act recovery money to help get people back on their feet in the sure. rebuilding of New Bedford or moving along things like the advanced manufacturing campus, mm-hmm. helping to bond millions of dollars for capital improvement projects to redo yeah. our roads and our schools or community preservation monies to help build back the arts and culture or open spaces of our city. But what I'm proud of the most, and I think you know where I'm going to go with this, I'm proud of my constituent service Above all, we've seen in the past when folks become council president or they become mayor or state rep or whatever, I don't know what happens there. There happens to be sometimes a disconnect. I don't know if they think they're a big shot or whatever, and the constituent service lacks. I am proud to say I still, despite my enhanced duties, returned every phone call, every text message, email, Facebook, social media tag, direct message, whatever, et cetera. Um, to service the constituents of the city of New Bedford. That's what I'm proud of the most because I think that's been my calling card since I've been in office, and I think most would agree. No, yeah, it absolutely has, and it's great that you were able to do that um, because, I mean, it really is uh, the most... I mean, you handle a lot of important stuff, but that's like one of the things that people really see on a day-to-day basis is how the counselor, how a counselor or an elected official responds to the the, the pothole the the pothole issues. So it's good that you're you're not giving that up in you know in the pursuit of uh, uh, you know 
higher positions within the uh, city council. So absolutely, yeah. Ian, um, are you going to run for council president again? Uh, the precedent's no. been set with Joe Lopes uh, last time. He ran for council president twice. So are you going to run again? No, I'm not, and I'm on the record stating that. This was a, a once-in-a-lifetime experience for me. In my view, I always wanted it. I had the gavel this year, um, and uh, and it was a great experience, and I'm ready to move forward with the next phase of my political and professional life. Um, you know, I've got SOMO at full throttle, as you know. We're yeah. relaunching, relaunching that. We've had a lot of, thank God, a lot of success with our first pop-up, and the requests for pints and gallons and restaurants reaching out have been off the charts. So in 2023, it's wheels up on that. And my campaign in 2023 for... Uh, for... For... for, for. Uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, and I'm not playing the game. We're going to have to see what how the landscape is. We're going to have to see uh, where I'm at uh, mentally as far as that goes and with my family well, and all of that. Well, well, let's see. Oh. Let's, so, so what you're saying is your campaign in 2023 isn't necessarily going to be for city council. Never say never, Marcus. <laughs> never say never. Um, uh, but I, I, I can guarantee this: God willing, as long as my health is there, and as long as you know, God willing, the health of my wife and children and family is there, I, I hope to be on some type of ballot, uh, and I will be on some type of ballot in the city of New Bedford in the fall of 2023. What that is yet, well, it'll remain to be seen. We'll have to. Uh, play it by ear i guess but i've enjoyed serving the residents of the city of new bedford i've been honored to do so and uh, i'll continue to do so in whatever capacity um i'd like to to venture into next and whatever capacity the residents would like to uh bestow the honor upon me with is there anybody that's in line to uh that's been putting their name in the hat that you want to support for council president in the next term well i support brad markey okay uh, ward uh, one council brad markey He's expressed interest, and I and I'm not sure. He, I know he's working. He'll have to answer on the votes on where he is on that. But I've I've, I've offered him my full support. As you know, he was my finance chairman this year. He was my essentially my number two in the whole process of um, of getting the ARPA deal done with yeah. the administration and our colleagues. And he's done a great job. This is now his. It'll be his sixth year on the council next year. He's ready for the big chair, and I support him and. We'll see how it goes next year. And I'm not sure if anybody else is interested, but anybody can run for council president and you take the vote accordingly and see how it falls. Yeah, um, Brad's a great guy, and I, I think he'd do a good job. So, um, so Ian, um, what? Uh, uh, before I let you go, I appreciate you coming on, giving us these important updates, um, some big uh, news being broken with the, uh, the movement of that ordinance for pay raises and the setting of the tax rate where you're saying that you're saving the taxpayers uh, some money in their tax rate, but... Um, how, uh, I was at the pop up briefly to get a bottle of, uh, of Silmo, uh, coffee, uh, coffee milk syrup. How was, um, how was it overall? How did the, how did the response go to, uh, your pop up? Well, unless everyone's lying to me, everyone has said it's been fantastic. Everyone loves the Silmo and those who remember Silmo, uh, all say it reminds them of their childhood. And mm. I think a little bit of retro and old school is a good thing. I think, uh, going back to a simpler time in our lives and, uh, reminding us a taste of childhood and home and that comfort, I think it was, I think it's a beautiful thing for uh, a lot of people in the community. And, um, I'm happy to bring this back. And the requests have been absolutely, um, on fire. The, the the Facebook Messenger, the friend requests on Facebook, the phone calls uh, from restaurants, from distributors locally and nationally, and even I got a call from one guy into, internationally. And I'm not going to wow. overextend myself. It's one step at a time, one foot in front of the other. But uh, I would anticipate big things for the Silmo Packaging Company in 2023. We want to continue to make the case as to why we are the pre best coffee syrup. Uh, and not just southeastern New England, but in all of the United States of America and all of the world as well. So uh, if you haven't had coffee milk yet, you got to get it. Even if you don't do milk, you can put coffee syrup in your eggnog. You can put it in uh, uh, coffee fizzes. You can put them in fraps. Or if you want to get a little saucy, you could put it in your rum chata. You could put it in your Baileys, your Kahlua. You can have some real holiday fun with it. So, um, But as you can tell, I'm very passionate about coffee yes. syrup. That's great, though. That's excellent. Ian, uh, congrats on that. Congrats on relaunching that business to the success that you've already seen. And uh, thanks for calling in and giving us these important updates. We'll uh, we'll talk to you more as, um, you know, your work continues. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, if I don't have the chance to come on your show between now and the holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah uh, to you and all of your listeners. And uh, May uh, 2023, bring everyone all the blessings they want and deserve. Thank you, and Appreciate it. Thank you, Marcus. So that was Council President Ian Abreu giving us some important updates immediately following the City Council meeting. Uh, we'll talk more about that at uh, after this break. 508-996-0500 is how you can get on. We'll also take your messages on the WBSM app chat. This is South Coast Tonight. I'm Marcus, and uh, I'm here with you. WBSM. Well, I saw fireworks from the freeway And behind closed eyes I can't make them go away Cause you were born on the 4th of July Freedom ring Well, something on the surface, it stinks I see something on the surface Well, it kind of makes me nervous Who say that you deserve this And what kind of God would serve this We will cure this dirty old disease Well, if you got the poison I've got the remedy The remedy is the experience Welcome back I don't know, just felt like playing Jason Mraz Why? I don't know why not? What's life without whimsy? So, uh, welcome back to South Coast tonight. I'm Marcus. 508-996-0500 is how you can get the program. Uh, we'll also take your messages on the WBSM app chat. Max from New Bedford asks, wait, did you say Republicans and Democrats have a history of cannibalizing each other? Um, I meant electorally, and I would say it's not a history. It's more of a recent development of electorally cannibalizing each other, not in the literal eat each other's sense like the Donner Party, um, you know, the, the party that went to the uh, that went on the Oregon Trail in like the mid 1800s and uh, lost their way and ended up literally eating each other um, or like that show Yellow Jackets on uh, Showtime, which is outstanding and you should definitely watch. Um, it's um, it's I meant electorally cannibalizing each other, not literally eating each other uh, in that sense. So like, for example, there were a few, like in Washington, there was a very reliably, there's a very reliably Republican district in Washington state where a Republican had a pro impeachment Republican had held that seat for a long time and probably would have gotten easily reelected. That person got primaried from their right, right? They got primaried from their right. They lost their primary. And then that person was not a palatable general election candidate and lost to a Democrat. Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Boost Champ Perez, who is a uh, car shop owner in, uh, in Washington. So that's what I mean by cannibalizing, right? When you, when you, you know, when you basically call a longstanding elected member of the party of your party, party in service of ideological aspiration, uh, more ideological consistency or purity or whatever. And then that person is, ends up losing the general election. You lose a seat because of that. That's what I mean by cannibalizing. That's what's happened. I mean, with the Democrats, honestly, every Democrat that actually has like in the house, as far as house races go, any Democrat that successfully primaried, a uh, like a notable incumbent to their left has actually won. So if you can win, that's it's fine, right? But if you can't, and it's pretty clear that you can't, like in a in a blue state like Washington, right? Um, then that's probably uh, probably not a good strategy. That's so that's what I mean by cannibalizing. But that was Council President Ian Abreu. Uh, Ian Abreu. He again important updates about lowering the tax rate. Which um, which is which is good. Uh, they were able to use some rainy day funds and ARPA funds to lower the tax rate a few dollars on the per one hundred uh, and per thousand, considering houses in New Bedford are you know worth a few hundred thousand dollars. That's going to add up uh, quite a bit on the uh, savings for your tax bill. Of course, that does depend on the assessor's um, assessor's. Uh, assessment of your uh, of your the assessor's office assessment of your property. So um, the other important thing that got sent to the ordinance committee. So it came out of finance. It went to the council. Then it has to go for a second reading uh, in the ordinance committee. 
Um, and ordinance and finance are probably the two most powerful committees in the council because ordinance is about drafting and amending all city codes and lawmaking, you know, is basically, you know, drafting and amending city codes is very much the business of the city council and finance is appropriating money, right? Is for appropriating money. So, um, I mean, property is pretty important too, uh, obviously, because the city owns a lot, you know, millions and millions of dollars of property and that city council oversees that too. But so it's going to the ordinance committee, um, for a second reading. And when it comes out of the ordinance committee, I believe it's going to go to the council floor for a full vote. And when it goes for a full vote, and if it passes, which we're, everybody's expecting it to pass, it's going to go to Mayor Mitchell's desk. He has indicated that he is going to sign it, even though there were some changes. There were some changes to the their proposal that he didn't necessarily uh, agree with. Um, I think he charged the council with um, not really basing their um, their amendments on, you know, studies or, you know, data that they had done uh, that they had, you know, they had hired an outside consulting firm, I think at the cost of $20,000. This is all reporting by Arthur Hirsch in the New Bedford Light, by, by the way, a really good long form reporting on this. Um, but basically, uh, they, but it seems like all the amendments that they proposed and passed were significant pay increases uh, and not decreases uh, from what Mayor Mitchell had proposed. But this is Basically, the situation is um, New Bedford currently, I think, has had 52, uh, 52 applicants. New Bedford's having a hard time retaining staff, right? They're having a hard time retaining um, necessary non-union jobs. Now, this pay raise applies to non-union jobs because union jobs, obviously, like police, fire, etc., they have their collective bargaining. They have the, they have the ability to collectively bargain and that's where they negotiate their pay scales and benefits and all of that with you you have a non-union job you know if you're working in a clerical staff or the department head or in a minute you know more of the uh, administrative administrative roles that falls outside of the union um and so you are you know in a position where you're negotiate you know you're you know you're looking to the mayor and the city council to pass a you know pass an ordinance like this one to give pay raises but it's 151 non-union positions um so they average these 151 non-union positions average about 13 percent below what employees are uh, comparably making in other areas of the city so what they're comparably making in other areas of the city again is about 13 percent that's a that's a significant number below what other cities and towns are making. And so this pay raise will raise it to about 3% above what other city and cities and towns are doing. Um, there's a few outliers uh, that there's a few, there's a few positions that will be making more about 30 to 50% more than the median income for other communities. So, um, I mean, it's an important step in getting, you know, qualified, competent representation, uh, you know, service uh, from the city government, because I think they're short staffed by about 250 people. They've got a 1300 uh, person workforce and they need another 250 people um, to have a fully staffed uh, city hall. So they're well below that. And that's obviously going to affect, you know, how services are delivered. And so the thing they've got to do is incentivize people especially in a, in a hyper competitive job market like this they really got to incentivize um people to want to come to new bedford and uh work there 508-996-0500 good evening good evening marcus how you doing i'm doing i uh, just heard about the uh, rate uh of the uh, taxes uh, yeah. going down Obviously, it, it had to go down because the value of the property is probably going to go way up. To give you an example, I inherited a, pro- a property after a member of my family passed away about three years ago. I had it evaluated, okay, and I was told that uh, appraisal that it was worth X number of dollars. Mm-hmm. I stood still for a while, but I had heard in the future that taxes in New Bedford were going to go up. 
and I, uh, you know, decided I better, you know, divulge myself of this property before they do go up and uh, being retired and, you know, not working. I, I, I don't think I could afford the two properties. Yeah. So I did, and uh, uh, again, I went to the person who appraised the house, and the appraiser told me, well, the house is worth double of what I told you three years ago. Oh. So I put that in perspective about the rate going down. Uh, yeah, it would be good to get the assessors in since we don't have uh, Peter Barney to do it anymore, God rest right. his soul. Yeah, I know. And That's have great. them explain that probably even though the rate is going down, you're going to get your annual Christmas card from the st- city. And I <laughs> firmly <laughs> believe card. your taxes are going to go up, up, up. Yeah. And that's the reason for me divulging myself of the property at my age and stuff like that. I just don't have, you know, the wherewithal to be, uh, you know, paying taxes in two places, especially with that kind of increase. Well, so well, to put it in perspective, again, again, yes, the rate will go down, but if the value of that property I owned three years ago when a family member passed is now worth double, okay, of what it was three years ago, uh, I think you're going to see uh, an increase in taxes. Significant. Yeah, significant. Well, well, it's 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 kind of like it, what they're doing is they're slowing the rate of increase by well, yeah, yeah, yeah. by it's, by knocking it down a few dollars. They're trying to you know uh, uh, buffet the uh, you know the, the the hit that you're going to take. Uh, uh, again, what I'm looking for is to see uh, what the tax on my house that I live in now is going to be compared with last December, and that's the true. You know, thing about uh, what if, if you're getting an increase or a decrease. It almost Ian Abel almost made it sound like you're going to get a decrease. No, you're not. You know, <laughs> and they went down on the on the rate because the valuation of the property is going to go up very high. And yeah, f- for you and Mr. You're, McCarthy, you're, uh, a, a, a great deal. Is that thing would be done if you is that you? You're, I think you're. Hold on. Okay. Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. I don't know if that's my headphones. Must be, actually, I, I hold got on the radio one second. on in the back, and I can hear my, myself coming through clear. So your headphones are messing up. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, so my headphones okay. um, had went out. So, yeah. Sorry, what were you saying? So you, you were saying that. Um, you know that they are saying that you're going to see a, a decrease in in your in your tax bill, but what you're saying is based on the, the you know the, the assessors the property. Yeah, there's going to be an increase. So you know, Mr. Abreu makes it sound like, hey, we went down on the rating. Oh, isn't that good? Yes, but what is the valuation that the assessors are going to place on the property? And that property I owned three years ago, uh, here, here was the price, six number of dollars, mm-hmm. and when I sold it <clears throat> three years later, uh, I got double of what I was appraised at. Uh, you know, three years ago, doing nothing to the property. So I didn't make any improvements or anything like that. So I think people can expect, I wish again Peter Barney was alive to, to explain this. All the people could do a far better job than me. Yeah. And really, you and Mr. McCarthy should get some of the uh, assessors on or those who want to come on uh, and see if I'm correct in, you know, what I think is going to happen. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, I think that's probably fair. And yeah, it's a good idea. It's something that we're, I'm, um, you know, going to, absolutely look into because that is really important information it's the thing that people probably care about the most too yep. uh, in terms of people that are voting in these elections because a lot of them are homeowners who, who are paying property well, taxes the problem is is the philosophy i know in your town i went i had a relationship with your town many years ago and mm-hmm. every time i went there i always said we got to tighten mm-hmm. our belts we got to sharpen our pencils Maybe you're hearing that phrase right now in Fairhaven. I don't know as an elected official. No, not okay. necessarily. Oh, you're not hearing that. They, they no. want to spend money in Fairhaven, huh? <laughs> well, well uh, <laughs> listen, where I'm, where I'm elected, we need actually more. We, we need a bigger budget because we're taking on more departments and all this it, other stuff. It's so. tough to get that in Fairhaven. I know I, because it, I, no, I know. heard you've got to tighten up belts. We've got to sharpen our pencils. And unfortunately, in New Bedford, I've never heard that come out of uh, government. Yeah, we got to try to tighten things up. We got to have a, we go, you know. Well, I mean, the city council makes cuts. They do their cut annual cut night, and a lot of councilors make cuts to stuff. And I, I thought last year they made some pretty, frankly, irresponsible cuts to certain yeah. really essential services. Yeah, usually, it's not big cuts. You know, they they don't. Well, really well, well, the problem is 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 that the cuts you make, like let's say it's a hundred thousand dollars here, hundred thousand there, or whatever. Yeah, it's. Minimal. It's 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 a four hundred and fifty million dollar budget. The cuts are yeah, are, are really more. Pa- small. It's yeah. Pa- yeah, it's pageantry. It's, yeah, the exactly. cuts are pageantry. Exactly. Pageantry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And again, to me, what New Bedford d- does need is yeah, a, a, 
a company to come in here and say, I want to be in New Bedford. Just yeah. like years ago in Fairhaven, you had AT&T go in there, and they called out the high school band and everything. They had a call center uh, that was put in. And it lasted two years because AT&T realized, I guess, if we have the call center overseas, we don't have to pay any money. And well, and yeah, that's, a, that's a much bigger problem than New Bedford can handle. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. I, but what, I, what I'm trying to say is you need some company – uh, that wants to come in and invest in New Bedford, and because and they want to come in not because we try to you know go after them as the mayor tries to do, but because they feel New Bedford is the place they want to be. Right. You know that that again would do it, but whether or not that happens, you know, I always laugh when the, you know I hear uh, the beginning of Moby Dick, "Call me Ishmael," yeah, because Ishmael is the outcast. And it seems like even since uh, him and Melville's time, we've been a city of outcasts trying to find their way some way, whether it's back then or today as we, uh, you know, take in uh, uh, people that are coming from other countries that are oppressed or whatever. And it seems that's in, in the world of the cosmic, that's New Bedford's lot to take in. Mm-hmm. All those that are, you know, looking for help, you know. Yeah, and, um, I think that's. I mean, that's a that's a tradition that dates back to really like Frederick Douglass and all of that. So it's a it's a, it's a proud tradition of, of of the city and of this area. I yeah, think. and that's true. If if you got, you know, the the the, the wherewithal back then, we had the whaling industry to provide, you know, jobs and wealth for the city. I guess New Bedford at that time was one of the wealthiest cities in the world. Yeah, you know? it was. And so an outcast could come here and find, you know. Uh, you know, some sort of way to make a living. I don't know if the city is in that great of a situation now. Yeah. And again, to keep on in, we're making investments. Where have any of those investments that have been made in the past years led to a ton of jobs? Well, what do you mean investment? Are well, you... I, that's what I hear from an elected official. We're doing this to make investments for the future. And then, yeah. You know, uh, again, I think if somebody somebody's going to come in here, it's going to be because of geography or something well, that they want to be here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, those in, investments in industries like, let's say, offshore wind won't metastasize immediately. It's it's something that's that takes time. You, you know, it's it's not a you're not going to wake up tomorrow and there's going to be. Well, I I, I, built, just, uh, you know, I just think an industry is going to come here regardless of what you do because they want to be here. You know, yeah. just like no, when, I, when I agree. he went to New Bedford, I mean, uh, Fairhaven, they wanted to be there. You know, yes. I, I don't think Fairhaven pursued them. Fairhaven just said. Hey, you want to be a sure? Call out the high school band, and we'll play for them and everything. And we have a yeah. call center here, and all of a sudden, poof! Yeah. They did business decided we, they could go elsewhere, and that that's what happened. Uh, uh, so, uh, again, uh, you know, they, they, I, I, if somebody wants to be in New Bedford, it's going to be because they want to be here for business reasons. Like if, if Amazon wanted to put a distribution center, unfortunately, geographically, I guess it's better to be in Fall River because you get access. To well, well, that's the other thing. That's the you know, you, you look at an area. If you're going to make investments in an area, you're going to look at the, the sort of the natural assets that they have. Um, so that's why sometimes, you know, the, the incentivizing the TIFs and all that other stuff, it isn't really necessary in a lot of cases because sometimes it's like, where are you going to go, right? Yeah. yeah. If every bit, honestly, if every municipality had just agreed to not do TIFs anymore, um, tax incentive financing, if they'd agreed to not, if every municipality did that, it would, I think, significantly change the landscape, um, of, of what they're doing. You know, like when everybody, speaking of Amazon, when everybody was, every city and town in the country was pimping themselves out uh, to Amazon, they ended up just going to New York. That's where they plan to go the whole time anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So. They, yeah they're going to go where they want to go. But yeah. I think, Fall River got that distribution center over us because geographically they get access yeah. to the province, they get yeah. access to uh, Boston, and even access to the state. And, and one of the reasons offshore wind is coming here, the main reason is that because the port, <laughs> the port is built out for it. It's the, there's the natural assets in well, the in the, in the infrastructure let's, here. Let's hope it, it does come in, provide some sort of jobs for somebody. I don't yeah. know if it will provide jobs to the people that are here with the skill set that they have. Right. Uh, but it would bring you know some money into the city, and hopefully it just doesn't become a place where they store the uh, the metal blades. Right. Hey, listen, I got to hit this break, oh, but I appreciate you calling you. in. Thanks for giving me uh, my two cents worth. Of course, absolutely. Five zero eight nine nine six zero five hundred. Take your message on the app chat. I'm gonna take a break. Fourteen twenty WBSM is now also on ninety nine point five FM. It's finally. You never know who will call in the South Coast tonight. But they want to hear from you most of all. Call 508-996-0500. Or use the WBSM app to send an app chat text message or leave voicemail. Hey, welcome back to the show. My name is Marcus, and this is uh, this is South Coast Tonight. Chris is going to be back tomorrow. We've got a great show planned for you. So, uh, And I'm here with you for the rest of the show. 
at 508-996-0500. We got some app chat messages that I'll get to in the nine o'clock hour. Um, you know, we're still getting updates on the Georgia Senate race between Raphael Warnock and uh, Herschel Walker. Again, I'm I'm still of the position that Warnock's going to win this race. Someone, uh, a pollster, had um, jokingly commented, "Surprise! People haven't changed their minds much from 28 days ago." <laughs> so, um, and that's probably you know where it's at and Warnock was leading back then. So I think that, uh, I, I think Warnock's going to lock it up tonight. I think he's going to get a full six year term in the Senate. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll get the updates. The, po- the polls closed at seven. They closed an hour earlier than Massachusetts and Georgia. Um, but since it's going to be a close election, um, probably closer than forecasted, uh, the election, um, they're still, you know, breaking down those results. But everything I've seen from people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do is that Warnock is, is in a very strong uh, position to get reelected for a full six year term in the Georgia Senate. So Georgia will have two Democratic senators for the next at least five, six years because John Ossoff isn't the, you know, serving the just served the first year of his full six year term that he had won. Uh, from Kelly Loeffler. All right, I'm going to take uh, one more break, uh, and then we'll finish out the hour strong. What is that? What is that? The new- I'm Marcus, 508-996-0500. I see some calls on the line. If you want to wait until the 9 o'clock, you can either call back, because I won't have time to get to you. You can either call back in the 9 o'clock. You can hold until uh, after the news break, and I'll get to you in the 9 o'clock hour, or you can call back in the 9 o'clock hour, whichever you prefer. And we'll take your call then. Open phone lines. Again, there's still the ongoing Georgia Senate race. Um, there's still the um, uh, that I think Warnock's going to win. But there's, you know, still some other. There's a lot of other good local stuff going on that we're going to talk about. And there's some app chat messages that I will uh, definitely get to in the uh, in the nine o'clock hour. So stay tuned. I am here until 10 